note that there are really three fundamental reasons that we've reached this low growth uh, environment. One is the United States has had a very muscular foreign policy, led the world over these past 50 years, fought for open trading systems, which of course we and our friendly competitors, UPS and others, benefit from. But quite frankly, the United States has been out-traded in most of these agreements. And as a consequence, we suffer a significant and chronic trade deficit, uh, which takes money right out of our GDP. President Obama, of course, has identified a renaissance in manufacturing of one of the key initiatives to restore American prosperity. And we certainly agree with that. But more modern and uh, bilateral agreements that are good for both parties, because after all, we love our shippers, whether they're China and Europe or the United States. We like traffic going both ways, not just one way. Second, the United States over the past 40 years, and remember, this is the 40th anniversary of the oil embargo, Arab oil embargo, which took place on October 16, 1973, has transferred more wealth in these 40 years than uh, any entity in the history of the world. And it's because we have allowed our oil and gas production to decline and have been forced to import our needs at one time, a few years ago, over 60% of our oil was imported, and it represented about 60% of our trade deficit. Again, dollars flowing out of the United States, which aren't recircled and recycled around the uh, United States economy, employing graduates from Montana Tech or uh, the various institutions of, of higher earning or the, our blue-collar folks who clearly are not seeing the type of job creation that the country should expect given the tremendous power of our economy, or at least the potential power of our economy. Fortunately, innovation, entrepreneurship, invention, the things that have been at the heart of American growth and prosperity have been at work in the oil and gas sector, and we've seen this incredible revolution in horizontal drilling and so-called fracking that is providing a renaissance in our oil and gas business. We're now down to a little over 40% of our oil and gas needs having to be imported and the jobs in the Bakken and down in the Eagle Ford Shale and offshore are producing thousands and tens of thousands of well-paying American jobs and adding to our economies. It's still about 60%, by the way, even with our resurgent production, it's still about 60% of our trade deficit. So as we produce more and more, and at the same time develop alternatives, because you've got to remember oil and gas is a worldwide market. So when the prices go up in one part of the world for oil, they go up everywhere. Canada and Norway, who are net oil exporters, saw their prices for fuel go up just like we saw. So in addition to producing all the oil and gas that we need to that we can possibly produce. We all also need to diversify our transportation sector. And nobody could be a better example of that than Elon Musk. I've been to Tesla. It's fantastic what they're doing. Battery technology is improving. Hybrids are becoming a bigger and bigger part of our transportation scene. We have almost 500 of them at FedEx today. And the new fuel efficiency standards put in by both the Bush and the Obama administration are meaning we're using less oil in, in, uh, in an absolute basis, and we're diversifying in terms of electrification of light-duty vehicles, personal and pickup and delivery vehicles, and natural gas for over-the-road vehicles. This afternoon, you'll hear from the president and CEO of FedEx Freight about our uh, demonstration units that we're now operating with CNG and LNG, and we're quite excited about that. 
But as you can see in the first slide I'm going to put up, despite those uh, good developments in uh, the oil and gas sector, and hopefully uh, a reinvigorated manufacturing sector and more uh, equal trade with our trading partners, particularly China and Japan, the United States is on a long-term trend for lower GDP growth. And this has been going on for a significant period of time. As I mentioned a moment ago, companies like Facebook and Google and FedEx and other entrepreneurial and innovative country, uh, companies are the engines that produce the growth in our economy. But with that innovation, you have to have coincident investment. And the next chart I put up usually brings gas from people. This is the correlation of business investment in equipment and software and job creation. Now my application to Montana Tech would not have lasted a nanosecond on the administrator's desk. I was lucky to get out of school as a liberal arts major and for the record I was very happy to get that C grade that Senator Baucus mentioned. But as you can see it almost looks like railroad tracks. Business investment in equipment and software is the primary driver of economic growth and job creation in the United States. We all know from the popular press that our job creation is not even keeping up with population growth. A great majority of the jobs that we are producing are part-time in low value added professions. We have the lowest labor participation in this country about 58 or 59 percent. I think at our zenith we were at about 63 percent. It's the lowest since 1978. Blue collar wages, unless you're fortunate enough to be a graduate of Montana Tech and petroleum engineer and get in trace of this fantastic energy revolution, in general blue collar wages are not growing. And there is significant and growing disparity in earnings capabilities in the various segments of our society. Next chart shows it clearly. Underinvestment has been a key factor in our inability to grow our GDP and produce the jobs that we want. You notice in 2009 there's a little uptick there, far below the 8.5% of GDP that we were spending in the early part of this century, but a little uptick. There's just no doubt about the fact that the big reason that that took place was the Congress and the Obama administration put in investment incentives on a temporary basis, so-called bonus depreciation. It allowed you to write off the value of your investment for tax purposes on the year that it was made rather than stringing out the depreciation over a number of years and having to pay taxes on the earnings. It's just a delay, kind of like the credit card company letting you have an extra month. You've got to pay the piper, though. But in my mind, the most important thing that took place that led us out of the Great Recession were those investment in incentives. Probably more important than the other two charts are the one I'm going to put up now. It shows the capital investment that we are making in the main is replacement capital. It's just for things wearing out. We're not putting in place the type of investment we need for future growth. Now everybody knows a story about the two teenagers and grandmother gives both of them a hundred bucks. One of them goes out and gets a lawnmower and every week from that point forward can earn enough money to buy himself some, some beer. The other grandson goes out, spends it all that weekend on beer, no lawnmower. The difference between capital investment and consumption is pretty clear to the American public. A lot of people try to make it arcane. It's very straightforward. You also have to see in the next slide the same thing is taking place in our public infrastructure. We're not investing enough in our highways, our bridges, our airports, and we're now at the 
lowest level of public investment that this country has seen since the end of World War II. And as the next slide shows, there's declining net government investment. So again, we are barely replenishing what we have. The tax system in the United States is broken. It incents financialization, leverage, private equity, speculation, excessive debt, and discourages investment in manufacturing, big service companies like FedEx and UPS, and all the other uh, entities that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Our tax rate is the highest of any industrialized country in the world. We're one of two countries that taxes on a worldwide basis instead of on a so-called territorial basis, the other being Chile, who has a tax rate of 20% versus our 35%. So if the people in this audience and the people of Montana and the people of the United States want to invigorate the American economy, it's a very straightforward path to do so. And it's get in train with your Senator Baucus and reform our tax code so it gets America back to business in those types of sectors and employ the blue collar workers and the middle income Americans that have been so disadvantaged by the tax codes that we, that we currently have. Thank you very much.